For the longest time, Chrysler remained silent with producing newly designed transmissions, especially when you compare them to the other manufacturers. But then they broke their silence with the release of their 45 RFE transmission. Since then, they have been very busy redesigning and enhancing what transmissions they already have. For example, there is now a 48 RE unit on the road using single-sided clutch plates in the overdrive section and increased pinions in the planetaries. They also redesigned the 606 transmission to function as a rear-wheel drive unit. Wayne is in the shop to show us this new unit. Wayne? It was in 1989 when Chrysler released their new 41TE transaxle which was very radical for the time, being a completely computer-controlled, spragless, clutch-to-clutch -clutch transmission. Since then, Chrysler has been very busy redesigning and enhancing the transmissions they already have, starting with their three-speed rear-wheel drive transmission, which evolved into the A500 518 618 overdrive unit, and a few years later, they underwent additional enhancements taking them to the RE designation. Then, of course, they redesigned the 41TE and developed the 42LE for their LH vehicles. And for their trucks, they produced the 45RFE, which looks like the 42LE and the RE units balled up into one. And now, for the 2003 Jeep Liberty vehicles, Chrysler designed a rear-wheel drive version of the 42LE called none other than the 42RLE. And as you can see in figures one and two, the clutch configuration and application are the same. Now I've placed this 42RLE alongside this 45RFE to give you a comparison of its stature. And as you can see, it is smaller in size, and it is being placed behind 3.7-liter engines as a standard package and optional behind the 2.4-liter engines. On the right side of the transmission, the 10-terminal solenoid case connector can be located as seen in Figure 3. On the left side of the transmission, we can see the typical input and output shaft speed sensors, the to and from cooler fittings, as well as the 10-way transmission range and fluid temperature sensor case connector. <coughs> the unit's pressure taps are easily accessible externally here on the front case corner Unlike the 45 RFE, which are located internally on the valve body, requiring a special pan with access ports and the needed extension fittings for any pressure testing, and in figure four, each of these pressure taps are identified and is accompanied with a pressure specification chart. Let's clear the bench of most of these transmissions and take a look at the inside of this unit. If you are familiar with the 42LE, you can see here that the 42RLE contains almost all of the same parts. The main difference, obviously, is that with this being a rear-wheel drive transmission, the hypoid final drive is eliminated. Otherwise, everything from the pump back is the same. One interesting change that came along with this redesign is located here inside this short adapter extension housing. Here we can see a grommet that seals up against the back side of the case here where oil, lube oil, is supplied to be passed through this grommet and pipe to lube the rear seal in this four-wheel drive adapter housing. As you can see in figures five and six, this lube originates off of the torque converter reg valve. This becomes very interesting now when we take a look at the valve body and trace this lube circuit. Here, in this corner of the valve body, near the solenoid assembly, is the port 
where the lube oil exits the valve body and enters the case here. If you carefully trace this circuit to the torque converter regulator valve, you will encounter a very interesting find. Over here and in figure seven, you can see this two bolt reinforcement plate. When this plate is lifted off of the valve body, a metered circuit hopping over a wall casting is observed. The circuit on this side of the wall leads you to the torque converter regulator valve. And the circuit on this side brings you to the corner port that fits into the rear of the case. So this means that if someone should mistakenly leave this reinforcement plate loose, the rear bearing and seal will be starved of lube oil. Although this valve body's valve identification and location seem to be similar with the 42 LE, as you can see in figure eight, as well as the check ball and thermal valve locations in figure nine, the valve bodies between the two units are different and will not interchange. Electrically, the unit is the same in many ways as the 42 LE. It has its own dedicated TCM in the engine compartment, as you can see in figure 10. Pin functions in the TCM 60-way connector, as provided in figure 11, confirms many similarities, with pin 56 being the hot at all times terminal, 19, 20, 59, and 60 are the familiar solenoid ground wire terminals, 9, 47, and 50 are still the pressure switch signals, to name just a few. The solenoids and pressure switch resistors also measure out the same. The connector pinout for this is provided in figure 12. The only terminal markings you will find is deep down inside the connector with the letter B for battery alongside terminal three. This is the hot in from the relay. Terminals one, two, four, and seven are the solenoid ground terminals and terminals five, six, and 10 are the pressure switch resistor circuits. So the check is easy. Place the positive lead on terminal three and with the negative lead make contact with each of the other pins to measure out the solenoids and resistors. In figure 13, we have provided for you the connector view and terminal identification for the transmission range sensor and ending with a full wiring schematic in figure 14 to assist you in diagnosing any wiring problems you may encounter from the transmission to the TCM. Computers are known to fail in several different ways. Solenoid drivers can go bad. Condensers could leak. Circuits could break. John is in ATSG's electronic shop, and he's going to show us a problem that can occur in the computer, which could produce intermittent fault codes, and how you might be able to fix it. John? All too often, an intermittent computer fault results in an expensive computer replacement when a simple repair could have taken care of it. There are many reasons for a computer to fail. Often it can be isolated to a mechanical issue. For example, if the computer is pressed or pushed or mounting bolts are loosened or tightened, or a particular vibration suddenly makes the computer break or begin to operate again. In this case, the problem is very likely to be a bad connection at the main jack or inside the box. Today we'll cover how to repair one of the most common causes of this type of fault, a broken trace on the printed circuit board, or PCB. You will need a few tools which are not normally found in the automotive environment. For starters, some type of ESD protection. These range from simple wrist straps to entire rooms dedicated to a static-free environment. For our purpose, an ESD mat and wrist straps connected to a proper ground will work fine. You may have heard that ESD protection is not as important today as it once was, and to a point this is true. For this repair, we'll have direct physical contact with component parts inside the computer, so ESD protection is essential. It's a good idea whenever you're working with computers and modules to follow ESD procedures anyway. Nothing worse than destroying an expensive computer because you rubbed your feet on the carpet. 
You'll also need some small tools for computer assembly and disassembly, and some dental tools or soldering tools for cleaning up the repair area. A small rotary tool with a wire brush or fine sanding disc is good for this as well. Under no circumstances should any grinding type of bit be used. Obtaining this gear is a great reason to locate and get to know your local electronics shop. You know the difference between the consumer-oriented auto parts store and a real parts counter. We have the same thing in the electronics world. A good electronics counter person is worth their weight in gold. Going in to buy an ESD mat, wrist strap, along with an iron and some solder is a great way to introduce yourself. In addition to replacement parts from inside the computer, the electronics shop is a great place for a wide variety of heat shrink, cable clips, connectors, replacement pins for connectors, all kinds of things like that. Okay, let's get into this repair. The first step is opening the box. Of course, the wrist strap goes on before opening the box. Different computers are assembled in different ways, but it's usually pretty easy to open them up. This computer has four screws, which I've already removed. Once the screws have been removed, the part of the cover opposite where the jacks are is raised, and the cover is moved forward to clear the jacks and the cover removed. Often this would be a stopping point. If there are several obviously blown parts, if the insides of the computer are just a big resin blob, or if there's an entire broccoli farm growing in there, you may reconsider replacing the computer at this point. If there is nothing irreparable, we move on to removing the PCB. There are two parts to extracting the PCB. One is the PCB mounting system itself. The other is various parts which are connected to the PCB and mounted to the case. Again, this assembly is fairly simple, and a good look should show you how. On this computer, the PCB mounting system is just five screws. Remove them and the PCB is loose. Often you'll see transistors and such mounted to a heat sink, which is then mounted to the case. On this computer, we have one transistor mounted to a heat sink, but fortunately the heat sink is mounted to the PCB, so disassembly of the heat sink will not be required. These two high power resistors, which are mounted to the case with these two sheet metal clips. The clips are simply bent out of the way. Then lift the opposite side of the PCB, and while removing the PCB by moving it away from the resistors, gently pry the resistors out of the clips. Now the PCB is free and clear. Now the real search for the actual fault begins. Again, a cursory look for the obvious. Here we're looking for lifted solder pads where wires and such connect to the PCB, broken wires, broken parts, indications of overheating, things like that. Don't forget, most modern day PCBs have two sides. Now a close visual inspection. Often a good magnifying glass helps. Here we are mostly following the traces, looking for any sign of a crack. Talcum powder or chalk dust sometimes helps as well. If we still haven't found anything, try flexing the PCB gently while looking at the traces. Here, we found our fault. I can see that only one of the traces along the crack line is actually breaking contact. Now for the actual repair. The first job is to prepare the area for the repair. The objective here is to remove the varnish coating from the trace while not damaging the trace itself. Dental tools and soldering tools are good for this. A small rotary tool with a wire brush or extra fine sanding disc are okay. Never use any type of grinding or cutting bit or wheel. All right, now that we have the area cleaned up, we want to prep the traces in our wire patch by tinning them with solder. Hold the iron lightly on the trace and apply a small dot of solder at the iron to act as a heat bridge to get the heat onto the trace more evenly. Now apply a small amount of solder to the trace a short space away from the iron. As the solder begins to flow, remove the iron. Now you should have a nice thick coat of fresh solder over the trace. Repeat the procedure on the other side of the crack. Now do basically the same thing to a short piece of wire. A good set of tweezers is great for this and really helps avoid burnt fingers. Next we hold the wire perpendicular to the crack and apply heat. As soon as the solder from the trace begins to flow around the wire, remove the heat. It is very important to hold everything still until the solder cools. This only takes a second. 
Last thing is just to trim the ends of the wire and you're done. You may want to make a more craftsmanlike job by applying a thin coat of clear nail polish over the repair area. Just reassemble the computer by reversing the disassembly procedure and it's ready to go back in the car. We now return to the live portion of our seminar.